Hello, my name is Paul Sapsford. The following coach education program was developed for Kelnor and was produced following consultation with Dr. Dean Lamont, Dr. Steve Miller and Dr. Derek Merckx of the Kinesiology Department at St. Mary's College of California, as well as former Stanford University head soccer coach, Brett Simon. I'd also like to thank Dr. Simon Jenkins of the Carnegie School of Sport and Education at Leeds Metropolitan University, Dr. Martin Underwood of the Physical Education Department at the University of Exeter, and also Dr. Dave Collins of the University of Central Lancashire and former Performance Director of UK Athletics. You may find the course manual by visiting calnorth.org, click Coaching, then Course Calendar, and clicking Calnorth F or the combined F and NSCA level 3 course. Then click View F License Manual. Or you may find it on the following web page. Soccer technique is the on field emphasis of this coaching license. Why so? A few quotes to reinforce this. If we never learn at an early age to be good on the ball, then it's just useless, said Landon Donovan. The important thing about the future of the women's game is technique, and that's something this country needs, technical players. They need to touch the ball quite a bit when they're young, very young, and spend time with the ball, Pia Sundhage. Our players lack sophistication. They're not technical enough, said Tony DiCicco. And finally, Jose Roman Alexanco said, We don't demand that youth teams win. We demand they play good soccer. A central tenet of this uh, coach education program is to educate coaches so they may in turn educate their players and perhaps their parents as well. We're going to look into self-esteem and applying the research of Dr. Carol Dweck to youth soccer. We'll also look at should the coach focus on effort, improving or winning and why? Thirdly, how can the coach answer the question, but what does he need to do to get more playing time coach? We'll also look into motivation, the importance of technique, Henry's said principle and 10,000 hours, as well as preparation for the US Soccer Federation's e-license. Two questions I'd like you to consider. Firstly, how do you raise self-esteem in others? And secondly, is it wise for parents to tell their children they have a host of wonderful attributes? Dr. Carol Dweck's research reveals there is a common misconception regarding how self-esteem is developed. These quotes illustrate this. Self-esteem is often portrayed as something we give to children by telling them they have a host of good things inside of them. These beliefs lead us to lie to children, to exaggerate positives, to sugarcoat negatives, or to hide negative information entirely. We fear that criticism will damage their self-esteem. Telling children they have a host of wonderful traits can lead to a sense of entitlement and avoidance of risks to doubt themselves when they fail and to cope poorly with setbacks. If we try to build a child's self-esteem by telling them how great they are, the effects are unlikely to be lasting and it may lead to a sense of entitlement. However, by providing an environment which focuses on effort and improvement, i.e. aspects under the child's control, we provide the child with the capability to overcome setbacks, become self-reliant and develop their self-worth. Consider the Chinese proverb, give a man a fish and he'll eat for a day, teach a man to fish and he will eat for the rest of his life. When coaches and parents emphasize effort and improvement, we teach the child how to enhance their own self-esteem, self being the operative word, and by doing so, we provide the child the capability to overcome 
life's hurdles and challenges. Here are eight tips that will enhance the likelihood of self-esteem being developed. Firstly, avoid comparing yourself with others. And this has been illustrated in sports science research produced by Joan Duda and Nato Manis in 2005. Secondly, your conversations that you have with yourself. Make sure that those conversations are positive. Sports scientists refer to those conversations as self-talk. Everybody has them. Nobody likes to talk about them. Make sure that you're saying positive things about yourself. Thirdly, become a great actor. Act in a confident manner, particularly when you're not feeling it. An example might be in a pre-game environment. You'll deceive yourself into feeling more confident. Next, surround yourself with positive people. The guru of optimism, Dr. Martin Seligman of the University of Pennsylvania, recommends at the end of each day, write down three things that went well for you. Next, try to live by the mantra, am I doing what's right? Am I doing the best I can? And am I treating others the way in which I would like to be treated? Next, adopt the mantra, setbacks are informative and are an opportunity to learn. You'll learn more when you fall short. And finally, accept applause, but don't expect it. So if you are a performer of any kind, at the end of your performance, don't go searching for that applause. Instead, focus on the effort that you put forth. You are able to control the effort you put in and let that be the source for your future motivation. Please consider the following scenario. Imagine you are the parent of a teenage child who has had a poor performance. Would you blame the coach or referee after the game in order to protect the child's self-esteem. And secondly, what would you say in the car journey home from the game following the poor performance of your teenage child? The car journey home from the game might not be the best time to communicate with a teenager following a poor performance or defeat. After a period of time, you might want to ask, what are your thoughts on the game last weekend? And what did you do well? What, what could you improve? The parent should listen for any words which place blame on uncontrollable factors. Having these attributions would likely reduce the child's perceptions of control and will likely increase anxiety for future competitions. Many parents believe that by blaming the referee or the coach after the game, they are protecting their child's self-esteem. In this scenario, the parent is attempting to deflect attention away from their child. However, this strategy has long-term detrimental implications. This behavior is inadvisable because it doesn't build the habits necessary for success. It reduces responsibility as well as the child's perceptions of control. Ultimately, this results in lower motivation, increased anxiety due to lowered perceptions of control, and a decline in effort. The parent's objective should be for their child to take ownership of their performance, good or bad, and if they perform poorly, they must own it and appreciate that with greater effort and preparation, they'll perform better next time. Remember the Florence Nightingale quote, I attribute my success to this. I never gave 
nor took any excuse. Dr. Carol Dweck is Professor of Psychology at Stanford University. One of the objectives of this course is to be able to apply her research to the field of soccer. Dweck has categorized individuals based on their perceptions of where ability comes from. Those who believe success is based on innate traits are said to have a fixed mindset. Others who believe success comes from effort, learning and improving, are said to have a growth mindset. Here's a question for your group to consider. Where does soccer ability come from? Is it something that you're born with? Or is it something that is developed? We took fifth graders. We give them puzzles to solve. So you see these blocks? Can you tell me what color is on that side? Red, yellow, white, blue. All right, so what I want you to do is put these blocks together so that the picture on top matches the picture here, all right? First, we give children a set of easier puzzles to do. Now here's the next one. When these nine and 10-year-olds successfully put together the puzzle, the children are praised for either their intelligence Wow, you did really well. You must be really smart at this. Or the effort they made. Wow, you did really well. You must have tried really hard at these. Then we give them a much harder set of problems. Ones that they might, in fact, struggle with. Here's the next one. And we see what happens to their confidence? Do they think, oh, this means I'm not good at it after all? Do they stop liking the puzzles? Or do they maintain their confidence and think, well, it just needs more effort or strategy? What happens to their motivation? Are you ready to go on? Ta-da! <laughs> we also ask them, well, what, which problems do you want to work on some more? those easier ones or those harder ones. And generally we find that the kids who have been praised for their intelligence really want to go back to those easier ones that were their, kind of their claim to fame. This is a sign of a fixed mindset, the belief that intelligence is innate and can't be changed. What we found was that children thought that that difficulty meant they weren't smart or they weren't good at the task. So you seem to have more trouble with this one, and I want to know why you think that was. Probably because I'm not good at these problems. A very discouraging conclusion. Other children show a growth mindset. The growth mindset is like this. No matter who you are, you can always become a great deal smarter. They feel smart when they're working really hard on something difficult and making progress. So if I give you some more problems, would you like more problems like these that are pretty easy so you'll do well, or problems like these that'll be hard but you might learn a lot from them? These. More like these? Students praised for effort generally want those hard ones that they can learn from. What I've learned from my research is that kids, and I think adults too, are exquisitely sensitive to what's going on in a situation what other people value, what they're being judged on. What is that voice in our head saying? Is it saying fixed mindset things like, oh, you better not make a mistake, you better look smart, people are judging you? Or is it saying growth mindset thing? Here's an opportunity, here's a mistake I can learn from. I feel smart when I do something difficult. One of the objectives of this course is to apply the research of Dr. Carol Dweck to soccer. And here's one such example. Tony Faulkner, the performance director at Blackburn Rovers, was concerned with his youth players who were not reaching their potential. He met with Dr. Carol Dweck to discover why. The players and the culture at Blackburn Rovers mistakenly believe that star players are born and not made. 
If you're told you've got immense natural talent, what is the point of practice? If anything, training hard will tell you and others that you have a lower level of natural talent. So the key is your perception of ability and where it comes from. Is ability innate and the environment focuses on the players exhibiting this innate talent? Or does the environment promote effort for development because you can improve your ability? I would like you to think of a challenging situation or a setback that any one of your players might come across. An example might be the player has just been cut from an Olympic development program. Players who attribute this failure to lack of ability, or as Dweck would say, a fixed mindset, become discouraged and lose confidence and motivation. However, those who see this setback as a source of information, Dweck would call these of a growth mindset, will increase their efforts and focus on what they need to do to improve. So going back to the Blackburn Rovers example, the Blackburn youth players didn't think that they lacked ability. Quite the opposite, they thought their natural talent would take them all the way. However, this attitude, I have natural ability mindset, explained their aversion to effort and focusing on improving. Consequently, Blackburn Rovers are starting workshops with recent recruits to encourage a growth or improvement comes through effort mindset. The team's talent scouts will be asking prospective players about their views on talent and training. Not to screen out those with a fixed mindset, but to target them for a growth mindset training program. Incidentally, the book I encourage reading is Mindset by Dr. Carol Dweck. Here are some examples of how good and bad habits are ingrained. If a player were to have an attitude such as, if I produce brilliant skill and demonstrate low effort, it proves how naturally talented I am. It's clearly a bad example to follow. Secondly, if you use the excuse, I was unsuccessful, but I wasn't really trying, again leads to lower levels of motivation and effort. However, two good examples are the following quotes. David impresses me by his example on the field. He never stops running. He always tries his hardest. That's Sir Alex Ferguson on the effort of David Beckham. And secondly, Lee Clark, manager at Birmingham City, on one of his players, Nikola Zigic. What he dished up was the worst effort I've seen in 25 years of professional football. The absolute minimum is to give everything every single day. So a good mindset demonstrated by the manager Lee Clark but not so Nikola Zigic the player. A coaching environment that is conducive to success will focus on four key elements. These can be summarized by using the acronym SITE S-I-T-E. The S stands for strategy, the I for improvement, the T for technique, and most importantly the E is for effort. And this is particularly pertinent to the youth coaching environment. Secondly, it's important to praise effort because players can control their personal level of effort and therefore this message reinforces to the athlete that they are in control of their performance. This will also likely build confidence and reduce anxiety. Here's an example of how to provide feedback which refers to the player's effort levels. Stephen, I like the way you put forth extra effort toward providing the team with width. Or Susan, the way you closed down the opponent's defenders was outstanding. Thirdly, avoid feedback that emphasizes that the athlete is naturally gifted or talented because this might lead them to believe they don't need to work as hard 
as others who they perceive are less talented. Fourth, coaches and players should adopt the mantra, setbacks are informative, you learn more when you fall short. And finally, constructive criticism is important, examples of which are, Matthew, I am disappointed when you don't put forth your best effort, or Sarah, drills that might appear laborious can actually help you work on your ability to focus. Challenge yourself to be engrossed in the minute details and complete the activity without your focus being disturbed. Again, this constructive criticism is tied to effort, again a factor that the players can control. Next, we're going to look at why the coach and player should not focus on winning, but instead should focus on the SIGHT acronym, that is strategy, improvement, technique, and effort. Former UCLA basketball coach John Wooden is generally regarded as one of the finest coaches in the history of North American competitive sport. It is common knowledge that he never focused his players' attention towards winning. He said, You cannot find a player who ever played for me at UCLA that can tell you he ever heard me mention winning a basketball game. Coach Wooden understood that focusing on winning places emphasis on factors out of the player's control, which can lead to increased feelings of anxiety prior to competition. So what did Wooden focus his players toward? Aspects under their control, such as effort. He said, the last thing I told my athletes just prior to tip off, before we go on the floor was, when the game is over, I want your head up. And I know there are only one way for your head to be up. And that's for you to know that you did your best. This means to do the best that you can do. That's the best, no one can do more, you made that effort. Well, in, in your book, Faith in the Game, you quote a lot of famous coaches, uh, philosophers, the Bible, everything. But one of the guys who's been a major influence on you, who's quite an author in his own right, is John Wooden. We had him up close, and uh, we talked to him about winning. And we mentioned, when you and you were talking before the show, what a legacy. I mean, no one will probably ever touch his winning percentage in the years that he put together. And I asked him about that. I said, how could winning not be important to you? And here's what he said. I wanted winning to be a byproduct of the preparation and, and of other things. I think getting there, I, I tried to teach, like Cervantes said, the road is better than the end. To me, practicing was the important thing. That's the teaching. I would like to, have uh, game time, come out of the stands and watch and see if I did a good job of teaching. How big an influence has he been to you? Well, uh, John Wooden was a huge influence. I, I read one of his books... Uh, early in my coaching career, I think maybe before I became head coach, and, and I noticed that uh, he said that he never mentioned winning to his players. And uh, I don't believe that I ever did either. I, I really tried to focus on the process. The idea was that if you, if you did the right things every day and uh, the drill work was good and the fundamentals were sound and the attitude was right, that the winning would take care of itself. And so we, we really focused more on the process of getting ready to play. And, uh, and that was the most important thing. Research from the field of sports psychology supports the player development approach as opposed to an approach that focuses on winning. Firstly, if the young athlete believes that mistakes are a natural part of the learning process and does not experience the coach's wrath after an error, they experience less anxiety, according to McArdle and Duda. And secondly, when the coach focuses on improving the player rather than winning, the player experiences less anxiety and more enjoyment. That's Newton and Duda. Whereas focusing on winning increases anxiety. Here are a couple of examples of how the coach might communicate the emphasis of effort in his pre-game speech. Firstly, at the end of each game, if you can look at yourself in the mirror and say you gave everything you had 
then you should be very satisfied. Or, as Baltimore Ravens linebacker Ray Lewis said, wins and losses come a dime a dozen, but effort, nobody can judge effort, because effort is between you and you. I can't, uh, I can't thank you guys for the opportunity. Let me tell you something. If tomorrow wasn't promised, what would you give for today? Forget everything else. Forget everything else. Forget that there was any sunlight left. What would you spend today thinking about? Yourself or the man that's beside you? Or the man that you know you'd give everything in your heart for? We get one opportunity in life. One chance in life to do whatever you're going to do. To lay your foundation and to make whatever mark you're going to make. Whatever legacy you're going to leave. Leave your legacy. And it's found through effort. Wins and losses come a dime a dozen. But effort, nobody can judge effort. Because effort is between you and you. Psychologist Mihai Chinsense Mihai coined the term flow, which many coaches and athletes might explain as playing in the zone. It refers to experiences of optimal human performance in which a high level of focus is achieved with minimal input from the conscious mind. The clearest indication of playing in the zone is when the athlete is totally absorbed in the moment and does not think about future outcomes or past performance. An excessive focus on winning from the coach or performer will diminish the likelihood of playing in the zone. When the coach or athlete focuses on future uncontrollable outcomes such as winning, you are not focusing on the immediate moment, which is a prerequisite for flow state experience. For further information, read Flow in Sports by Jackson and Chinsets Mihai. Ross Bentley, um, kind of a world-renowned racing car coach, read my book and contacted me. He saw the connection between a growth mindset and optimal performance. Uh, these uh, top races last for, many of them last for hours. And in the course of the event, mistakes are inevitable. The difference between a winning driver and a losing driver is what you do with those mistakes. Uh, w over the course of our conversations, we developed some collaborative work to see whether, in fact, racing drivers who have a growth mindset um, are able to enter the zone and stay in the zone even after they've made mistakes. Dr. Alan Goldberg received his doctorate in counseling psychology from the University of Massachusetts, Amherst. He has been working in the field of applied sports psychology for over 28 years and is considered to be one of the leading international experts in the field today. In the following video, Dr. Goldberg explains why it's not beneficial to focus on winning. What are the wrong goals when you walk on the field? What are the wrong goals? Winning, that's the wrong goal. You know why that's the wrong goal? That's a byproduct of doing everything right. You don't have to worry about winning. The problem is if you're focusing your kids on winning, you're going to set them up to fail because you're focusing them on something that's going to get them uptight and it's going to distract them. If you're focusing them on winning, you're going to set up something inside of them where they're afraid of making mistakes, and they're going to get kind of preoccupied with that. Now, trust me, I'm not ever telling athletes you don't want to have goals. Goals are critically important. Why? Why are goals important? What's the purpose of goals? Something to work towards. Goals motivate us to train hard. See, what a lot of kids don't understand are your goals, your expectations, 
They're training tools. They're training tools to get you to work hard in practice. The biggest mistake a kid could make, and you as a coach as well, is to take your goals or expectations onto the field with you when it counts. Okay, because if you walk on the field with expectations, you're creating this internal sense of urgency. I have to, I've got to, I need to, oh my God, what if I don't? And then what happens is it creates a certain headset. And the headset it creates is, well, I'm going to give you two of them. It's the opposite sides of the same coin. If I'm pressuring myself, and this is critical, or this game is critical, then number one, I'll either try too hard, I'll muscle everything, okay, and my timing will be way off, or I'll get re really tight and really tentative, and I'll start playing cautiously. So it means I get up to the plate, and I'm taking pitches, and I'm striking out a lot, okay? Goals are a training tool for practice. And if you've done your work in practice, it's there. It's already inside. It's like you've programmed the computer. What you want to do when you get to a game is gently hit the print button. You don't have to pound on the sucker. You know, it's like you don't want to be serious about this. Because serious shuts kids down. And my feeling is the bigger the game, the more important it is. Can you imagine what it's like for an Olympic athlete to go into the Olympics and think to themselves, I have sweated and busted my ass and, and bled for four years for this moment. So I better not mess it up. What's that going to do to you? I mean, you know, it's intuitively you know that, but it's actually a mental mistake to, to take the outcome and what's important into a game. That is, a, it's a mental mistake. Finally, here are a couple of quotes from respected professionals within the game. Jose Ramon Alexanco said, We don't demand that the youth teams win. We demand that they play good soccer. We don't use the word winning. Not until after the players reach 16 is their fitness training. Before that age, we mainly play soccer. Everything is with the ball and he's the FC Barcelona youth director. Whereas Landon Donovan said, it's amazing to me that people put so much emphasis on trying to be tactical and worry about winning when it doesn't matter when you're 12 years old. We're going to have big, strong, fast players. We're Americans, we're athletes. But if we never learn at an early age to be good on the ball, then it's just useless. Playing time is not always under the control of the athlete because it's difficult to control the behavior of others. This is how Dr. Goldberg responds to the playing time question. The other thing that's important for parents to keep in mind is we want to encourage our children, like it or not, to play the role that the coach assigned them on the team. This is how teams win this is how you learn to support your teammates and if your role is a support player you come off the bench you might not like it but it's absolutely critical that you learn to do that role to the best of your ability and we want parents to support their kids to encourage their kids to do that the other key issue and again it comes from a parent's perspective having a better perspective is you want to encourage your children to channel their disappointment and their anger and their frustration and their feelings that this isn't fair into hard work. You want them to take the adversity of not getting playing time and use it to motivate themselves. Use it to work much harder. Use it to maintain a positive attitude. Uh, and to not, it's very easy for kids to kind of succumb to the gravitational pull of disappointment and being bitter. And you don't want them to do that. You want to encourage them to channel it constructively. Well, I think if, you're, if your child's old enough, it's reasonable to encourage them, like if they're an adolescent, it's reasonable to encourage them to talk to the coach about it. You know, my advice around that is you go and talk to the coach in this kind of way. It's kind of like having the attitude, so coach, what do I need to do to get better? You know, I'd like more playing time, but I want to get better. 
So what, what can I do to get better? Give me some drills, give me some exercises, that sort of thing. Um, now, having said that, sometimes your child is not old enough to talk to the coach. And my advice to you about you talking to the coach is it is a very slippery, very steep slope. And if you are going to talk to the coach, I would not go beyond asking him or her the same kind of informational question. What can my child do to improve? What can my child do to get better? Because I think the last thing you want to do as a parent is get involved in a discussion with the coach about, hey, my child deserves to be playing, um, and you're not starting him, and my child's better than so-and-so. Because I think to every parent, even when you have a perspective, you don't have a perspective, because it's your child. And, you know, the coach, again, let's, let's, let me come back to my initial point. Fair or unfair, it is the coach's prerogative to determine who plays or not. And it's very important that you as a parent keep that in perspective. And I guess in closing, to help your child maintain all of this in perspective. So it might be your child's not getting playing time now, but if they work hard and they're dedicated and motivated, you know, maybe next year they'll get more playing time. Maybe they're a freshman now. Maybe by the time they're a junior or a senior, their time will come. Their moment will come. You know, it's important, again, be empathic with your child. It's a very hard role to play. Being a support player, sitting on the bench, toughest role on the team to play, but someone has to play it. And you want to help your child play it with class and dignity and motivation. Here's another example how you might reply to the playing time question. I want you to focus on controllable factors such as the effort with which you put forth in closing down the opponent's defenders. Your strength is your long range shooting, but an area to improve would be the quality of your first touch. And here's how to improve that. In this example, no promises of playing time are provided. However, particularly at the recreational level, it's important that the coach considers effort and improvement when assessing playing time on the field of play. The following two slides focus on motivation and commitment. McElroy and Kirkendall surveyed youth sport participants and asked them to select one of four choices for the most important reason for participating in sport. Over 2,000 boys and girls were surveyed. The most popular response was to play as well as you can. That was 51% of boys and 48.3% of girls. In second place was to play fairly and to play by the rules at all times. That was from 24.4% of boys and 37.6% of girls. Much lower in third place was to defeat your opponent or the other team. That winning orientation was only prevalent in 13.5% of boys and only 4% of girls. And finally, Everyone on the team should get to play. For boys, that was 11% and for girls, 9%. So it's interesting to note that this winning orientation, this ego orientation, is only prevalent in 13.5% of boys and 4% of girls. And it will be interesting to conduct this survey amongst adults. One would imagine that this winning orientation is perhaps higher among adults. Stephen R. Covey illustrated the internal nature of motivation when he said, Motivation is a fire from within. If someone else tries to light that fire under you, chances are it will burn very briefly. So it's important for coaches to conduct individual player meetings in order to better understand the motivations of their athletes and also to have these individuals make commitments to improving. World-renowned sports psychologist Dr. Dan Gold of Michigan State University provides an excellent model to stimulate conversation for these meetings. The GROW acronym involves asking athletes the following questions. 
Firstly, the G stands for goal questions. For example, what are your future goals, dreams and aspirations? Secondly, the R stands for reality questions. What have you done previously to achieve your goals? And where do you stand in terms of your current level of performance? Also, what are your strengths? Thirdly, option questions. What do you need to do to improve? Or what has worked for you in the past? And finally, the W stands for will questions. For example, given what we've discussed today, what can I expect to see from you in the future? Or what will you work on in the coming weeks? It's important the athlete and the coach record this information in order to make this commitment concrete. The following four slides focus on teaching motor skills and motor learning. According to the Fitz and Posner model of skill acquisition, participants go through three stages of learning. Here's some advice on how and what to teach depending on the stage of the participant. Firstly, teaching at the cognitive stage or beginner. At this stage, the learner is devoting a great deal of time to thinking about the movement. Therefore, the coach who constantly bellows instruction is likely to interfere with the learning process. Next, visual demonstration of the skill or technique is crucial. Next, players need to know what they are doing correctly so they can concentrate on parts of the skill they need to improve. For example, your pl plant foot is pointing to the target, that's good, now focus on striking the middle of the ball with the inside of your foot to keep it on the ground. And finally, provide the learner with adequate opportunity to practice the skill. Patience is very important at this stage. The second stage in the Fitz and Posner model is the associative stage, if you like, the intermediate participant. The coach should firstly provide opportunities for the athlete to assess their own performance. For example, the coach might ask, why do you think that shot went over the crossbar? Next, help the athlete develop cues for correction. For example, to shoot low, knee of the kicking foot, and head over the ball. And thirdly, ask the athlete what they believe they need to do to improve and provide solutions regarding how this might be achieved. The last stage, according to Fitz and Posner, is the autonomous stage for the advanced athlete. At this stage, concentrate on how and when to apply a particular skill. For example, where and when to beat an opponent with a move. Next, focus on the specificity of skills. For example, why the fullback might need to bend the pass down the line to meet the forwards run, as opposed to a driven pass down the line. And finally, increase strategic and tactical instruction. For example, we're 1-0 down with five minutes remaining. What should we do in this particular situation? As a side note, Two of the finest coaches that I have had the good fortune to work with are Paul Ratcliffe and Brett Simon. Someone once said of Paul, he's a man of few words, and that may be so. But when we speak less frequently, our words carry more weight. Also, excessive feedback from coaches can interfere with the learning process. So coaches shouldn't be paid by the word, but by the quality of their instruction. Here are some features of effective coaching. Firstly, practices that focus on the end product rather than the process have detrimental effects on learning and motivation, according to Piaget and Wersemer. An example of the process-oriented coaching appeared in a recent documentary featuring basketball at Duke University. The head coach and his assistants were assessing shooting technique and had their back to the basket. This allowed the coaches to focus entirely 
on the technique or process of the shooter and not the end result, i.e. whether or not the shot was successful or unsuccessful. Secondly, how do you enable children to become more self-reliant and not dependent on coaches to feel good about themselves? You should avoid statements such as, you are great. It's better to say, your work rate was great today, i.e. the action the player did was great, a subtle yet significant difference. And finally, John Wooden commented, a coach is someone who can give correction without causing resentment. This statement illustrates the significance of understanding the group and the individuals you're working with. For example, are they sensitive to criticism? Are they accustomed to a culture of entitlement? Unless the coach is adaptable, it may prove a hurdle to group success and morale. Why to reflect on your coaching session? Here are some questions you might like to ask yourself. Were your drills or activities appropriate for the ability of the players? Did your coaching affect the players? If so, how? Did you use guided discovery by asking questions of your players? Did you show it rather than talk it? Remember, a picture paints a thousand words. Were you pleased with how the players responded to your feedback? If not, how might you address this next time? Next, how might you improve the training session? And finally, what will you focus on next time? Here are some important player safety considerations. Heading the ball poses two challenges to young players. Firstly, does the child possess adequate neck strength? And secondly, are the motor nerves in the neck developed sufficiently to make repetitive heading safe? Research in this field is equivocal. However, it's safe to assume that heading for nine-year-olds and younger places the participant at considerable risk and thus inadvisable. Secondly, allow for hydration breaks approximately every 30 minutes and more often, such as 15 to 20 minutes, when it's hot and or the, your athletes are 12 years and younger. For young athletes, water is almost always adequate. However, older athletes, because of the increased intensity, may want to consider some sports drink along with water. The coach should always check goals are anchored and safe and players are wearing appropriate attire, especially footwear and shin guards. And have parents provide the coach with contact telephone numbers in case of an emergency. The following four slides aim to prepare the coach for the US Soccer Federation's e-license. Motor learning, skill acquisition and preparation for US Soccer Federation licensing. Firstly, blocked or random practice and what does research tell us about the best environment to create depending on the ability of the performer? An example of a blocked practice is when the player passes the ball along the ground against a wall from 5 yards for 30 repetitions then 10 yards for 30 reps, and then 15 yards for 30 reps. Whereas a random practice would involve the player changing the distance with each delivery. So it's the order of practicing one particular skill. Most studies reveal that when the performer is a novice, then a blocked approach is beneficial for skill acquisition. So lots of repetition for the beginner. However, research illustrates that random practice is preferred when the performer is intermediate or advanced in terms of learning and transfer of skills 
to new contexts. What is variable practice? Variable practice involves changing the aspects of one particular skill, for example striking a driven pass when the ball and target are moving. Studies reveal it leads to enhanced transfer to new tasks. If the athlete is sufficiently competent, motor learning research illustrates that the most beneficial learning environment is small-sided games which provide a combination of random and variable conditions. In my personal experience of US Soccer Federation courses, they would appear to encourage random and variable conditions as opposed to a blocked practice environment. Therefore, the e-licensed candidate could prepare themselves by creating coaching sessions in a random and variable environment. If you refer to the F license manual, you will see an example of a practice coaching plan. Here is additional preparation for the E license. Prepare your practices so that challenges to the player are increased gradually from simple to complex. For example, start with no pressure, no opposition, and then increase the pressure. How might you increase this pressure? Three examples might be by adding opponents, manipulating the playing area, or increasing decision-making options. Your warm-up should link with the objectives to come and continue to focus on your objectives in the main activity and always conclude with an actual game. It's important to provide information that is correct and concise because irrelevant or excessive feedback is likely to create confusion. The e-license focuses on age 9 through 12, so ensure that the activities are developmentally appropriate. Here's more information from the US Soccer Federation's e-license curriculum. Stage 1 is your technical warm-up. The purpose here is to prepare the players for the activity ahead and allow many repetitions. Stage two is your small-sided activity in which you would introduce individual and small group tactics. At stage three you would expand on your small-sided activity to include a direction of play and add the principles of attack and defense. More on this in the next slide. At stage four is the game. There are no conditions. Use a formation and introduce the offside law and other laws of the game. There are required components at each stage. Firstly, introduce some level of opposition by stage two. Introduce specific attacking and defending direction by stage three. And introduce the unrestricted game environment by stage four, including goals and goalkeepers. The previous slide referred to the principles of play, which will be introduced at the e-license at stage 3. But what are these principles of play? Alan Wade, former director of coaching for the English Football Association, was the first to formalise the principles in the late 1960s in the manual The FA Guide to Training and Coaching. Tony Waiters, the former coach of the Canadian national team, said, a coach who does not fully understand the principles of play will always be tactically challenged. So what are these principles of play? Firstly, the five attacking principles are number one, penetration. For example, is there a forward pass? Secondly, support of the player in possession in order to retain possession. Thirdly, width of the attack. Fourth, mobility, for example, speed of play, movement and interchanging of positions. And finally, the improvisation or creativity of the players in attack. And the five principles of defense are firstly, delay, for example, 
should the defender apply immediate pressure or drop off? Secondly, depth, meaning defensive support. Thirdly, the concentration or compaction of the defense. Fourth, balance. That refers to the position of the defenders other than the first and second defender. And finally, the discipline and patience of the defense. Why is technical development so important for the younger athlete? The United States Soccer Federation has suggested that the golden age of learning is the 9 through 12 years of age range. And much has been written of the need to devote 10,000 hours to achieve mastery. For example, Ericsson in 2007. However, less has been written of the said principle postulated by Berkeley professor Franklin M. Henry. The said principle contends that the human body will make specific adaptations to imposed demands. Therefore, if the young player adopts incorrect technique at an early age and this becomes ingrained, the coach will find technique difficult to improve or change at a later date. I would highly recommend reading Bounce by Matthew Said if you are interested in understanding how talent is developed. Matthew Said is a sports journalist on The Times. He's also a former British and Commonwealth table tennis champion. He grew up here in suburban Reading. He's just written a book, Bounce, about what it takes to become a top sportsman or woman, or indeed a high achiever in virtually any walk of life. You may think it has a lot to do with God-given talent, but according to Matthew Said, you'd be wrong. I went to his childhood home to meet the author. So, Matthew Said, hard to credit it now, but this is where your table tennis career began because in that garage there was a table tennis table. Yeah, believe it or not, despite all the clutter, there was a table there and it's where me and my brother Andy started playing table tennis and it became a massive part of both of our lives. I ended up becoming three times Commonwealth champion and British number one. But it wasn't just you and your brother, was it? Because down the street there were loads of kids who were really good at table tennis. One of the most remarkable phenomena you, you could imagine that this single street produced more top table tennis players in the early 1980s than the rest of the nation combined. The concentration of excellence here was astonishing. So why? Well, when I became the top table tennis player, my natural inference was it's because of my genes, that I had a special genetic inheritance, which is the way that we normally think about excellence. But of course, Silverdale Road hadn't been hit by a genetic mutation that none of the surrounding streets and villages had been hit by. And of course, the reason that we had become good is because we had access to the best coach who taught on the school just off Silverdale Road, and he gave us access to the only 24-hour-a-day club. So we started out as very ordinary table tennis players, but through the transformational power of practice, we became extraordinary. So what you're saying is that anyone, any child living around here, given that opportunity, could have become a top-flight table tennis player, but they didn't. Lots of kids around here either never played it at all or were only mediocre. So what picked out you and your brother and those other high-achieving kids? Well, I think it hinged on belief. And I'll explain it like this. If you believe that excellence hinges on talent, then any time you fail, you're going to interpret that as meaning you have insufficient talent and you're likely to give up. If, on the other hand, you believe that excellence hinges on effort, any failure you'll see as an opportunity to adapt and grow. And that perseverance will lead to the excellence. All right, but you had not only tremendous skill born of lots and lots of practice, but you were also able to perform at the very highest level, the Commonwealth Games, the Olympic Games. Now that's about something different, isn't it? Let's go to that table tennis club you talked about and discuss that. Matthew, it's mesmerising watching you. Where are we? Well, we're at the Kingfisher Club, which is where all of the champions from Silverdale Road learnt their stuff at the hands of Peter Charters, who was a teacher at the local school, Aldrington, who set us all off on the path to excellence. You've clearly acquired tremendous skill, uh, but it doesn't preclude you having a conversation about something completely different. No, it doesn't. And, and it's interesting that in order to become proficient in a skill, over time, 
you move from consciously controlling the skill to being able to perform it subconsciously, which is why you can multitask when you get to a certain level of proficiency, the way that we can all drive and think about what we're going to have for dinner at the same time. Now, you can clearly play table tennis to a very, very high level of skill, but that's not the same, is it, uh, as competing in the Olympics, Commonwealth Games, as you did. What's required for that? Well, you're absolutely right. You have to be able to transfer or translate that skill into peak performance under pressure. And one of the most vivid phenomenons in sport is that of choking, where you see top players suddenly unable to perform the skill that they've spent a lifetime honing. And I argue that what happens when you deconstruct that psychological phenomenon is that top players, instead of doing it subconsciously, automatically, fluently, they go back to when they were a beginner. They're so anxious that they begin to try and explicitly or consciously control a skill that ought to be delivered automatically. But the belief, the mental capacity and the drive to want to perform at the very highest levels, isn't that something that you're innately born with? Well, I think you're right that drive is absolutely crucial. Because if you don't care about the destination of excellence, you're not likely to get there. And one of the great tragedies in sport and elsewhere in life is that a lot of kids are trying to ingrain excellence for the wrong reasons. They're doing it because their parents want them to or because their coach wants them to. They're fearful of being told off. And unless that motivation, that drive is internalised, young people are on the road not to excellence but to burnout. The following slides refer to the technique of various soccer skills. Your instructor will reinforce this on the field of play and illustrate how to organise each activity. Also remember the coaching manual available online at calnorth.org details this information. This activity is called left, right or opposite and it can be used to teach turns or changing direction with the ball and dribbling. Examples of turns that you will be taught include the inside hook, outside hook, the drag back, the drag back behind the standing leg, the step over turn and Cruyff turn. Technical coaching points to consider. Encourage dribbling with the head up and as the dribbler approaches the turn, they should take smaller touches to keep the ball close. Immediately after executing the turn, the player should take a longer touch so they can accelerate away from the defender. This passing in sequence activity is used to teach short passing. Technical coaching points for this. Plant foot points to the target. Kicking foot comes through the ball at a 90 degree angle to the plant foot and maintain this shape through impact. The kicking foot should strike the ball with the inside of the foot, hit the middle of the ball to keep it on the ground with ankle firm and toe points slightly up. Using the outside of the foot technique, place the non-kicking foot slightly behind the ball and far enough to allow a full swing of the kicking leg. The plant foot should be pointed away from your target, strike the ball with the outside of the foot at the ball's horizontal point. For this short passing activity the technical points have been made previously. Additionally this drill can be used to teach the players that sometimes when in possession, particularly in the final third, you have to draw the defender towards you before passing it to a teammate. This allows the pass recipient more time when they receive possession of the ball. Your instructor will explain this activity in detail on the field of play. The various technical coaching points have been made previously however you should remember that this activity can be manipulated depending on the ability of the players. It starts out with a 5 versus 2 however that could be manipulated for less skilled players for example you could use 4 versus 1 in each box. Alternatively Reduce the number of passes required for a team to move boxes. For more advanced players, you might reduce the size of the boxes and or increase the number of passes required for your team to move boxes. For this activity, you will be taught the technical demands of the long driven pass and also the ability to bend the pass. The technical demands for this are Firstly, for the driven pass, to approach the ball from approximately 30 degree angle, 
The plant foot points to the target and is placed beside the ball, slightly behind the ball for more loft, approximately 12 inches to the side of the ball. This allows the kicking foot the room to slide under the ball, thus generating height and backspin. The sole of the kicking foot will remain low through impact and the kicking foot comes around the plant leg. For bending the long pass, approach the ball from a steeper angle, approximately 60 degrees. This time, the plant foot points away from the target. For example, for a right-footed player bending the ball to the left, the plant foot points to the right of the target. The spin is generated by the kicking foot coming across the ball and the toe of the kicking foot points slightly up. This activity is used to teach receiving skills, technical coaching points to consider. Firstly, can we encourage the recipient receiving on the half turn as it will be easier for them to pass forwards with their second touch if they do so. Secondly, when checking toward the ball, ensure that the receiving players don't check too soon, thus killing their own space. Ask your players does the player on the ball have their head up and ready to pass? If not, then retain your position and your patience. Thirdly, when checking toward the ball, can the receiving player make an angled run as opposed to a straight run toward the ball? Straight passes tend to be predictable and easier to defend against. And fourthly, the recipient might want to have a look over their shoulder to simulate looking for the defender so that when they receive the ball, they know where the opponent is standing. This is a passing and receiving activity in a more game-like setting. Technical coaching points have previously been mentioned. However, in particular, look for scenarios if uh, the player is not marked too closely by the opponent. Can they receive the ball on the half turn? If they can, it will allow them to pass forwards quicker. The purpose for the neutral all offense player is that it provides more opportunities to receive the ball on the half turn because there's always an extra attacking player. This activity will be used to teach moves to beat the opponent. The dribbling player should dribble with their head up, taking short touches prior to conducting the move. Players should dribble with the outside of their instep and be on their toes. Players should make the move approximately one and a half to two yards before the defender, or cone in this case. A variety of moves can be incorporated such as the scissor, double scissor, the Matthews, the self pass, Zidane roulette, the snake, etc. And a progression would be to add a passive defender to replace the central cone. This activity is called two versus one in two boxes and is used to teach dribbling, moves to beat the opponent, and it could also be used to teach defending. Technical coaching points to consider. The attacking player in possession has to make a decision based on the positioning of the defender. If the defender takes away the passing lane, then perhaps a move is in order or they can beat the defender with the speed of their dribble. If the de defender encourages the pass, then ensure that the dribbler draws the defender toward them before passing it to their teammate. This allows the pass recipient more time when they receive the pass. And finally, encourage creative. The technical coaching points for this one versus one defending activity are as follows. When applying initial pressure, notice that red player number one bends their run slightly to force play to the outside away from their goal. Their stance should be side on in order to force the opponent in one direction. This teaches players to make the opponent decision more predictable. The red defender should run quickly to apply pressure, but when close to the opponent, reduce the speed and put the brakes on approximately one and a half to two yards from the ball. 
The higher the level of play, the more important patient defending becomes. So teach the players to only stab for the ball when they have a realistic chance of connecting. The defender's stance should be low, bending at the knees with the weight on the balls of the feet. Next is two versus two defending and we will focus on the role of the first defender and the second defender. Notice from this illustration that the second defender supports the first defender by dropping off and pinching in to prevent the penetrating pass. Also, if the first defender is beaten, the second defender is in a position to provide cover. If the opponent passes to their teammate, the second defender applies pressure while the ball is traveling and in doing so becomes the first defender and the first defender drops back and becomes the second defender. This activity allows the coach to intervene with coaching points for 1v1 and 2v2 both attacking and defensive coaching points previously made. This activity will be used to teach the various shooting techniques, many of which have already been incorporated, such as the inside of the foot push pass when shots are closer to the goal. Further out, a driven instep pass or bending of the shot, previously described. However, when shooting low for power with the laces, the angle of approach should be approximately 20 degrees. Plant foot should be beside the ball, a common error being that the plant foot is placed too far behind the ball, causing the shot to go over the crossbar. The head and knee of the kicking foot must be over the ball, and the toe of the kicking foot points down through impact. Finally, strike the ball with the laces and assess the player's balance after contact. Good balance assists effective technique. This is a fun shooting activity and the technical coaching points for shooting have previously been made. However, I'd like you to consider a progression. Consider that when players are young, the goal is large and the keeper is small, so shooting high is rewarded. However, as players age, the keepers become taller. So the ability to shoot low becomes increasingly important. A progression to encourage this is to say, the goal only counts if the shot remains below the height of the coach's waist. This one versus one shooting game allows the players to practice various shooting techniques under pressure. If the keeper is close, consider a shot hard and low to the ground. If the attacker wants to take on or go around the keeper, review the key factors described previously under moves to be. This activity is used to teach defensive heading. Technical coaching points for this include Firstly, player gets into line with the flight of the ball. Power is generated from the lower body, then upper body, then shoulders and neck. Thirdly, make contact with the ball at the hairline on the forehead. Fourthly, keep eyes open as long as possible, although instinctively players will blink when they make contact with the ball. And finally, after contact, the eyes should point to the sky the objective of defensive heading is to achieve distance and height in order to provide the time for the defense to reorganize and regroup. This head tennis game is used to teach the technical coaching points of attacking heading. The coaching points are similar to the previous coaching points for defensive heading, except the eye should point down to the ground after contact with the ball. When heading for goal, it's more difficult for the goalkeeper to contend with the ball that bounces in front of them, so heading low is advised. This activity is an example of the game is the teacher, because it teaches the players in possession to play with their head up in order to locate the opponent's goalkeeper who can take away 
one of the two goals. This will enhance the player's ability to switch the point of the attack, or it might encourage a quick counter-attack. Therefore, this game will enhance technical ability, such as players' ability to dribble with their head up, and also their tactical decision-making capabilities. For example, when to switch the play and when to counter-attack. Although this activity is a little artificial, it does encourage movement off the ball. It can also be used to introduce fundamental concepts of width, depth and support, which are components of the principles of play covered in the F course and more advanced licenses. This activity illustrates that the vast majority of conditioning exercises can be conducted with the ball thereby improving fitness as well as technical Finally, the following three slides illustrate how the coach might put together these activities into a training session. For example, when coaching a theme of short passing, the technical warm-up might include the activities on page 19, 20 or 21 of the coaching manual. Your small-sided activity might be receiving on the half turn on page 25 of the manual. Thirdly, your expanded small-sided activity might be the game on page 37 or 38 of the coaching manual. And finally, you would conclude with the game which would have no conditions and you would use a formation with the offside rule in place. Please remember that the coaching manual is available at CalNorth Dot org. Should you have any questions whatsoever, don't hesitate to email me. My email address is psapsford at calnorth.org.